Okay, so we've got this region. I graphed it in Desmos. The red curve is x to the 15th. The blue curve is y equals x. We want to just look at the piece that's in the first quadrant. We want to rotate that about the x-axis, creating a solid of revolution. And we want to find the volume of that solid of revolution. So we are going to choose uh, either a vertical or a horizontal element to create the solid. And which should we which should we use, a vertical or horizontal element? So we're going around the x-axis. And we are going to use a vertical element. When that vertical element is rotated around the x-axis, it will create a washer. <clears throat> and we know that the area of a washer is going to be pi times the big radius squared minus the little radius squared. <clears throat> so far so good? The big radius is the radius on the outside here. That's with the red curve. That's going to form capital R. And the little radius will be right there. So the big radius is generated with the red curve. The red curve is x to the 1 15th. So we're going to write this as pi times x to the 1 15th squared, which will be x to the 2 15th minus the little radius that's given by the other function, y equals x. We square that. We now have an area function of x. So we plug in an x value between 0 and 1. That will be the radius of the corresponding disk. So we integrate the area function to get volume. Integrate area to get volume. So we're going to integrate that function there. The pi we can factor to the front in a moment. So any questions with that? <coughs> All right, so now we just integrate using the power rule. So the volume will be pi times we have to add 1 to that exponent of 2 fifteenths, so that will give us 17 fifteenths. Divide by 17 fifteenths, that means multiply by 15 seventeenths. Minus x cubed divided by 3, 0 to 1, etc. So we plug in the 1. We get 15 over 17 minus 1 third. Plug in the 0. We don't get anything. We get, what do we get? Would you ever want to take the x squared and make it like a 30 over 15 and combine the exponents there and make it easier for yourself? Or is that going to Can we do that? Can you combine? Somebody tell us. Can we do that? So the question you're essentially asking is can you add? powers of x that have different exponents. So well, like, can I make like the x squared into a 30th over 15 and then combine them? Right, that, I know. Yeah. I know that that's what you're asking. Okay. So here's a simpler question. Can you add x squared and x cubed? No. No. Okay, so then you just can't combine them. Yeah, so you can't combine them. The only way you can combine powers of x is if they have the exact same oh, yeah, power. Okay. If they have the exact same power, then you can combine them. Yeah, no problem. We'll do as much refreshing as we can, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, if you have a Calc 1 question or any, you know, anything from before, don't hesitate in asking. I know some teachers are really uptight about it. That's a prerequisite scale, we're not going over it. I don't mind going over a few little things here and there. Um. <laughs> any other questions on there? Now if we were multiplying those powers of x, It'd be okay. yeah. then we'd add the exponents yes. so we'd yeah. get a common denominator. Yeah. All right, so. Let's continue on unless I have another question. And <coughs> for the shell method, yeah. that part, how would we do that? Oh, did it ask for both methods? Yes. Sorry, I didn't pay attention to that. Okay, so that is using the washer method, and I guess I missed that it 
Right. Find the volume with both disk washer and shell. All right, so let's set up the shell method. So let's take the graph and let's re, let's start from scratch. So I should be able to grab and clone that graph. Cloning is the end thing. So if we're going to use a shell method, we would want to choose a horizontal element. That horizontal element rotated about the x-axis will create a cylinder. And the area of a cylinder is 2 pi r h. <coughs> and when we look at our sketch here, the radius of the cylinder is right here. That's supposed to be an r. And the height of the cylinder is this. That's h. Now, when we look at our element, it's horizontal, so its thickness is dy, which means we're going to integrate with respect to y. So we want to create an area function that's a function of y. All right, this curve right here is y equals x, which is the same thing as x equals y. The red curve is y equals x to the 1 15th. So we're going to need to rewrite that and solve for x. We need to write it as an x value. So we're going to take the 15th power of both sides, and we'll have x equals y to the 15th. Is that good for everybody? And then we can do what we're asked to do. So the radius is right here. The radius is y, and then the height is there, the right curve minus the left curve, so it's y minus y to the 15th. Okay with that? So horizontal distance, we subtract x values We've written this function as x equals. We've written this function as x equals. So it's the right x minus the left x. And then we integrate. So 2 pi can factor to the front. <coughs> we'll distribute this y, giving us that. And they have intersections of 0 and 1 still. This intersection is coming from the y-axis, though. So we're integrating 0 to 1 that direction. Whereas the other one, we're integrating 0 to 1, but it's this direction. Does that make sense to everybody? And the power rule, again, applies right here. We can simply use the add 1 and divide by the new exponent rule. Zero doesn't contribute, so we end up with this, which you can get a common denominator, and then combine it into one fraction. We should get the same answer as the other method. So any step on the shell method there that you want to talk about? sense to everybody that's good so let's go <coughs> over to six five we're going to wrap up six five we have a few slides left that we didn't finish off we were in the middle of this hideous problem which we should probably start from scratch you talk about each step again because these can be a little bit overwhelming these crazy crazy ones so we've got this wild function written as a function of y, and we're trying to find arc length. And you may say, why do they have to create such a wild and crazy looking function? Why can't we just have e to the y and e to the minus y or something? And the reason is they've, they need this funky step down here. What we need is 
for it to unravel, once you take the derivative and square it and add one, you have to be able to get back to a perfect square trinomial. So what they've done is concocted exponents and coefficients so that when you take the derivative, you square it and you add one, you get a perfect square trinomial. So that's why when you look in this section, these functions look pretty crazy. So we've got that function. We take its derivative. Remember when you differentiate an exponential, you get itself. So the two is just going to float. Derivative of e to some power is itself multiplied by the derivative of the exponent. So that's how we ended up with our derivative. Derivative of an exponential is itself multiplied by the derivative of the exponent. <coughs> and then for our, our formula, just recall that our formula, we are going to be integrating the square root of 1 plus x prime squared dy. That's our arc length formula. And then whatever our limits happen to be. Call them A and B or C and D or whatever. So that's where we're going. So then we square it. Squaring was hard because we have to foil that crazy looking expression. So we square the first term. 2 root 2 squared is 8. Square this exponential. That means add a factor of 2 in here. Squaring the last becomes plus 2 over 256, which is 1 over 128. That drops down. And then the weird part for most people is looking in here. That's 2AB. That's this times this doubled. When you multiply e to the root 2y and e to the minus root 2y, that becomes e to the 0, which is 1. So you get 2 root 2 times negative root 2 over 16, which is 1 fourth, negative 1 fourth, and then we double it. That puts us to that position. And then we have to do the add 1. So we have x prime squared. We add 1, and we notice that when we add 1, it looks identical to this, which we got from squaring that. So this trinomial is also a perfect square. The only difference is that this is a plus instead of a minus. All right, so that's kind of where we left off. <coughs> Our formula says integrate the square root of that. So the square root peels off the square. We're just going to integrate this. So that's where we're at. So does anyone have a question before we start with the integration of that thing? Yeah? Um, when you first take the derivative of x, of x yep. you don't have to mess with like having y prime in that derivative? No. So that's a great question. So that has to do with implicit differentiation when you're assuming that y is a function of x. So here, we're just treating y as the independent variable. Okay. So when you treat, normally we have x as the independent variable. So if we have y equals x cubed, and we say take the derivative, we get this. It, we're just changing our perspective, and we're saying, OK, we're going to let y be the independent variable. So let's suppose we have y to the half. Then x prime is nothing more than this. Okay. So it's different then implicit differentiation, implicit differentiation happens when you can't write one letter explicitly in terms of the other. So for example, we have x squared plus y squared equals 1. Here you cannot solve for x, you cannot solve for y uniquely. There's going to be a plus or minus in there. So when you can't solve and make a dependent variable with a unique expression, then you use implicit differentiation. So up here, if we wanted to differentiate implicitly, we would do this thing d dx of both sides. Then you have to treat y as a function of x, so you get 2y, y prime, which we'll do a little bit of that later. <coughs> All right, so we have this situation where we're going to integrate with respect to y. The integral of an exponential is itself divided by the derivative of the exponent. Gabby? Um, but we, have to take the root of we take the square root of all of this, but there's a square there. Okay. 
So when we take that square root, that square vanishes. So the square root of 1 plus x prime squared, 1 plus x prime squared um, is right here. 1 plus x prime squared, and when we, uh, because this was a perfect square trinomial, we introduce that square, and when we take the square root of that, it disappears. So the square root of x, the square root of x prime squared plus 1 will just be that. Which again is why they had to cook it up the way they cooked it up with those coefficients and those exponents so that you had a perfect square trinomial that would factor into a square so that when you take the square root it vanishes. If the functions weren't nice it would be way messier. <laughs> it looks pretty messy as it is. Yeah. Uh, all right. So integrating an exponential is itself divided by the derivative of the exponent. So this first piece is going to look like this. The derivative of the exponent is root 2, so we have to divide by root 2, which will cancel with that root 2. <coughs> Over here, we divide by negative root 2. So the root 2 in the numerator of the coefficient will cancel, and we introduce a minus. And then this is 0 to ln of 2 divided by square root of 2. So we're going to plug in the upper limit for the y values. Root 2's are going to cancel. So we're going to get 2e to the natural log of 2 minus 1 16th. Root 2's are going to cancel again. We're going to get minus natural log of 2. And then we subtract off the value at 0. So we subtract off 2 and we add 1 16. And then we have to remember some laws of exponents with uh, logarithms. So e as the base, ln as the exponent, those will undo each other. They're, they're uh, inverses of each other. So here we'll get 2 times 2, which is 4. Oh, did I write everything down with that 1 16th? There should be an e here. Sorry, I forgot the e. There should be minus 1 16th e to the negative ln of 2. So we'd like to do something similar with that second term. We'd like that e and that natural log to undo, undo each other. But that minus is in the way. So what do we do with that minus? Bring it to the power. Bring it up as a power. So that minus is going to come up here. And 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half. So we're going to end up with negative 1 16th times 1 half. And then over here, we could get a common denominator of 16 right here. <coughs> so of minus 32 over 16 plus 1 is minus 31 over 16. And then we just combine those and get whatever we get. So it looks like we're going to have to have a 32 as a denominator over here. So we're going to have 4 uh, times 32, which is what, 128. We're going to have 128 over 32 minus 1 over 32 minus 62 over 32. Whatever that turns into. 63, 37, 57, 65. Let me double check. It is. That is right. Okay. So that'll be our. What were we finding? Arc length. That's the arc length of the curve. Any issues with the exponents and the logs? Is that OK? <coughs> All right, let's carry on. Another one. This, is, uh, no, this one is given as a function of x. So we don't have to do any rewriting as a function of y. We can just go ahead and do it. 
So we find the derivative and the derivative of ln x is 1 over x, so this will be 3 over x. The derivative of x squared over 24, bring down the 2, subtract 1, so we get minus x over 12. <coughs> Again, we're targeting, this is our formula. Whatever our limits happen to be. That's our formula for arc length. So we've taken the derivative, now we have to square it. So foiling, let's do the first and last term first, since those are the easiest. And then we do the middle term, product of the two, doubled. So we have to multiply 3 over x by minus x over 12 and double it. The x's cancel, we get minus 1 fourth. We double it, we get minus 1 half. We've seen this game before. Add 1. And when we add 1, we have the exact same trinomial, except for a different sign in the middle. So this is going to turn, bless you, this is going to factor into 3 over x plus x over 12 quantity squared. So then, if you come up here, s is going to be the integral of the square root of that. The square root of that, the square root just disappears and we have the base. So we're going to integrate 3 over x plus x over 12 with respect to x. And our limits were given to be 1 and 6. <coughs> Integrating, we get 3 natural log absolute x plus x squared over 24, 1 to 6. Throw in the 6, throw in the 1. So we get 3 ln 6 plus 3 halves minus natural log of 1 is 0, so minus 1 24th. The only thing we can do is combine those two constants, and that's good. That's, yeah, that's about it. Common denominator of 24, so we get 36 over 24. So 35 over 24. That will be our arc length. Any questions on any steps? I'll let you set these uh, set these two up. So these are arc length with technology with a calculator or some sort of graphing utility, something that can calculate a numeric integral. So you guys set it up and then we'll talk about why we can't do it by hand and why we have to use technology.
So this is y prime squared, and then we add one to it. So this is y prime squared, and then we add one to that entire quantity right there, which would make all constant. So we're adding one to both sides of this. After the change squared? Yep, after we square it. So right here we square it first, and then we add the one. So we square that. So even though we have, uh, I guess, a one over the no. Yes, exactly. We just add it. So then we end up with 1 plus y prime squared. Yeah, and then we just square that. All right, well, let's take a look at this. It looks like a really simple function. When someone says find the arc length of uh, y equals x squared, it feels like that should be easy. But it's not. So we take our derivative, and when we take the derivative, we get 2x, and then we square the derivative, and then we add 1 to that squared derivative. So we have that. <coughs> so our arc length is then the integral of the square root of that quantity from negative 1 to 1. And that is an integrand that is not integrable yet. You use imaginary numbers? Uh, we don't need imaginary numbers for this. We just need a different technique, which we're going to learn. We're going to learn in a little bit, a few weeks. We'll learn something called trigonometric substitution. And what we will find out is that when we have sums of squares or differences of squares, we can use a substitution technique with a trig function. And then it will all unravel very nicely. But at this point, we can't integrate that. And so we'd have to use technology. And so you can use your graphing calculator. You can use Desmos. You can use whatever. Uh, so let's go ahead and just do this in Desmos. So I can show you, because some of you may not know that you can do this in Desmos. Let's see. I'm trying to drag stuff around in there. It's a little hard sometimes. Let's use the mouse, put you back up there, go over to Desmos. All I want to do is move this so that we can see the function right there. Get these guys out of here. So in Desmos, if you type INT, it automatically turns into an integral. Oh. Put That's negative hard. 1, tab 1, tab. And I have to put the square root of that. So what I'll do is write it as 4x squared plus 1. And then I'll raise that to the 1 half power. So that will be the square root of that quantity. I'll hit tab again, put the dx, and there's the answer. So Desmos is a great tool to evaluate definite integrals that uh, you can't integrate by hand. Even ones that you can integrate by hand, five seconds and you've checked to see if your answer is right, which is a good strategy. So that's 2.9. Oh my god, I can't, I can't tell what that that says. Sir, I did it on my calculator, it just said error. Yeah, so you did something wrong. <laughs> so 2.96. 2.96, yeah. It, your ca graphing calculator should be able to calculate that pretty easily. So if I translated that over properly, 2.96, yeah. <coughs> Did it work out? Did you get it right now? Yeah. yeah. All right, so pretty slick. That's how we would do it with technology. Let's go ahead and why don't you guys set up the second one. We'll talk about why we can't integrate that yet also. Got to get you in the habit of the 1 plus y prime squared or 1 plus y prime squared square rooted.
question or you can ask. I just don't quite understand why we can't integrate. Okay. Great question, because that's one of the hard things in Calc 2 is distinguishing integrands that you can and cannot integrate. So the natural choice here, because you have some crazy function under the square root, what you would like to do is use substitution. So the natural choice would be to say, hey, let's let u equal 4x squared plus 1. But when you do that, you get that du is 8x dx. And so you would have u to the 1 half, but when you replace your dx, there you, you can't get rid of, you're going to still have x's in it, right? If you, if you divide both sides here by 8x, dx is du over 8x. So you'd still have an x in there. There's no way to sort of get rid of all the x's. They keep coming back in with your substitution. So now if the integral had an x right there, then you could use substitution because the derivative of your, of your quadratic would be a linear and you could do it then. So we can't integrate the square root of this quadratic because there's no x's on the outside that will group with the differential. So you can't like undo the chain rule? No, not with that. No such luck. And you can't break that square root apart, right? Everyone clear you can't make that the square root of 4x squared plus the square root of 1? Right? You can't bust the square root apart. If you could, things would be very different. <coughs> so this won't work. All right, so let's take a look at our situation here. We take the derivative, we get cosine, we square it, we get cosine squared, we add 1. We have cosine squared of x plus 1. So our integral then for the arc length is the integral from 0 to pi of the square root of 1 plus cosine squared x. And similar situation, we can't integrate that at this point. You know, if it was 1 minus cosine squared, we could do it. Because we could replace 1 minus cosine squared with sine squared, the square root of sine squared would be sine. So if it was 1 minus cosine squared, we would be totally fine. But 1 plus cosine squared, there's no identity that would easily collapse those into 1 square that could then be square rooted. So we can't integrate that right now. So again, we'll just go to a graphing utility. All right, let's check. Let's see if that's what we get over here. Oh, I shrunk the row. What the heck? I need to do this over here. All right, so when we take a look at Desmos, we're going to replace our limits. We're going to make that 0, make this pi. Square root can be the same, the 1 can be the same, we just have to get rid of that, make that cosine of x. And I, gotta, I need to put in some extra parentheses here to take that one. So, everyone agree that that's what it should look like? Yeah, question? Isn't it the uh, derivative of cosine x neg negative sine x? Which is We're taking the derivative of sine. The derivative of sine is positive cosine. Derivative of cosine would be negative sine. So we're starting with this function, sine x, and its derivative will be positive cosine. So if we started with y equals cosine, the derivative would be y prime equals negative sine. <coughs> and there's our answer. So 3.82 is the approximate answer. So that's another good use for Desmos. Approximately 3.82. So that's how you will do it with technology if you have to. And again, that's a great way to check your work when you don't need technology just to make sure you're doing it right. Always good to check your answer. 
Any other questions before we go on to surface area? All right. Going, going, gone. <coughs> All right, surface area. So we're going to start with regular curve, a function of x. And we're going to rotate that curve around an axis. But instead of thinking of rotating the region, we're just going to rotate the curve, creating a surface and not a solid. So we're just rotating the curve, not this whole region like we've been doing in the, with the solids of revolution. So we're creating a surface of revolution. And we now want to find the surface area of that. So the idea is that when you do your cross sections, you're going to create all of these rings that are going to be approximated by frustrums of a cone. So part of a cone, just the bottom part of a cone. So these frustums, we add all those frustums together. That'll give us an approximation for the surface area. And if we let those frustums get tinier and tinier and tinier, we'll get better and better approximation. We take the limit as n goes to infinity, we get the exact surface area. So it's all going to boil down to the area of a frustum. And you don't need to know the area of a frustum. Don't worry about that. The way we're going to think about it is slightly different. That's the mathematical justification for using the formula we're about to come up with. What I want to do is create more of an intuitive approach to this. Uh, you can find the area of this frustum and take the limit. That's not a problem. <coughs> but what I want to do is remind you, we talked about this last time, when you're looking at a curve, the exact movement along there, the exact distance along a curve is called the uh, increment, if you're going along the curve. And then ds is the arc length differential. And we have, let me draw a separate picture over here just to remind you. So we've got this curve. And we want to find the distance between two points, say there and there. Well, we're going to create this differential triangle. And the base of this triangle is dx. The height is dy. And the hypotenuse is ds. And the exact distance between these two points along the arc is delta s. So that equation right there, Pythagorean theorem, we solve for ds. We say, OK, we need to have a dx on the outside so that we can integrate it. So we multiply top and bottom of this by dx squared. We factor out a dx, like we did the last class, and we end up with this. So there's our expression for ds. That's arc length. We just did that. Right? That's the arc length formula. 1 plus y prime squared square root dx. That's arc length. We just did that. So here's the intuitive approach that I want to look at. So arc length, again, our function is not written in terms of arc length. We don't have a function of s, so we can't just integrate this directly. That's why we have to switch to x's. If our functions were written in terms of s instead of x, we could integrate directly, just like we integrate functions of x directly. If, if the variable of integration matches the differ, the differential, no problem. You just integrate, and you're done. So if we had a function of s with respect to s, no problem. We could just integrate that, and we'd be done. But we write our functions as functions of x, not s, so we have to convert the s's to x's so that we can integrate. So now, there <coughs> is a circumference expression right here. 2 pi r is the circumference of a circle. So the way intuitively that you grasp the surface area formula is this. You look over here, and you think about each of these rings is a circumference of a circle. And the idea is that we want to 
add up all of these circumferences with respect to S. We're moving along the curve, so we're moving along with respect to S. And so the idea is that if you take and integrate the circumference multiplied by ds, you've got it. ds is approximately this right here, and you multiply by the circumference. That's essentially giving you an approximation for a frustum. And so the formula, the intuitive idea, is that we're integrating circumference with respect to s. Well, the radius is just going to be given by the function. And ds, we just did that. ds is arc length. That's the arc length piece that we've just been working with. So the only difference is that we use the arc length formula, but we throw a 2 pi r in front of the arc length formula. So 2 pi r is the circumference. Circumference times ds gives us what we're looking for. So that's going to be the formula that we use, 2 pi r ds. So f is just representing the radius. And all of that's representing arc, the uh, arc length differential, <coughs> ds. So let's try a couple of these. So I went through all these black boxes. I just went through because the new book has problems rearranged and renumbered. And it's, it's a pain. I can't just type in here. So if you see these black boxes, it's just because I crossed out what the numbers used to be. You put in what the numbers are supposed to be now. So we've got a curve, a pretty simple quadratic. We're going to rotate it about the x-axis, creating a paraboloid. So a, a parabola, uh, actually it's not going to, yeah, it's going to be a paraboloid. Paraboloid is basically a three-dimensional parabola cup. So we're going to rotate this about the x-axis uh, on that interval, and we want to find the surface area of that resulting paraboloid. So. Let's think about the circumference first. Circumference is 2 pi r. Let's draw a little sketch, just so that we're not totally baffled. So we have to look between 9 and 20. We have a couple of choices here when we're trying to come up with a sketch. We could just plug in the 9, plug in the 20. We know we have a square root function. That's a reasonable way to draw a sketch of what we're looking at. So let's just call this 9. Plug in 9, square root of 9 is 3. 3 times uh, 8 is 24. And we'll just call that 24. Plug in the 20. Oh, they didn't even give us a perfect square. OK, gee, thanks. All right, so then this is the square root of 20 times 8, whatever that is. It's going to be up here a little bit more. There's going to be kind of an arc to it. This board needs to be oriented. Um, let me just orient this real quickly. Can I orient it now that we are in that work here? Right. <coughs> oh, great. This one. Somebody said it so that you have to hit five million of these things. All right, so the radius then is going to be given by our function. And you can see that right there. So that's going to be the radius of the corresponding circumference. So this is the random element at x, vertical element at x. We rotate around, we're going to get a circle of radius r. So now we're not rotating the whole region, we're just rotating this point, right? At each point, we rotate it around and create a circle. And so our surface area is going to be 2 pi. <coughs> uh, let me write this as circumference first. Circumference is going to be 2 pi r ds. Actually, it's just 2 pi r. Hmm, what do I want to write here? <laughs> so we integrate the circumference times ds. I was thinking about trying to rewrite this like we've been doing in the past. What's the area of a disk? What's the area of a washer? What's the area of a cylinder? This is a little bit different. It might not be, it might, it might be harder to do that same type of modeling. So let's just go straight again to the integral. So the integral will be 2 pi r ds. That's probably just the easiest way to write it. Now, <coughs> the limits are 9 and 20 with respect to x. 
So it's not correct to do this. That's not correct because it's not s equals 9 and s equals 20, which is what this implies. So let's not put those on here yet, or if we do put them on, we would emphasize that they're not s. So you could do this, you know, or you can just wait for a moment and put them on once you turn things to x's. Doesn't really matter. Just so it's clear, though, if the differential is ds, these limits should be s's, and if they're not, you need to somehow indicate that. All right. So let's go ahead and put in our radius. Our radius is the function, 8 root x. And now we have to do the ds thing. Now we do the whole arc length thing that we did in the past. To find arc length, let's come off to the side. If we have y equals 8 root x, y prime is going to be 4x to the minus 1 half. Or you could write that as 4 divided by square root of x. And then you have to square it. And then you have to add 1. We'll do that all in one step. That's simple enough. So we take the derivative, we square it, we add 1, and then we take the square root of it. And that goes in here. Now, our integration variable is x, so now we can put our x limits without having to be extra careful. Just put them in, no problem. Now we have to integrate that. So here is going to be our plan. Our plan is to combine those two square roots. I'll pull out the 8. When you multiply two square roots, you just multiply the two insides. So the inside of this square root is x. The inside of that square root, 16 over x plus 1. We just multiply those together. So this becomes the square root of 16 plus x dx. So the x in there, it just, the, the effect is that we're just distributing it to both terms inside. Product of square roots is the square root of the product. <coughs> this is easy to integrate. Once again, remember, you cannot break that square root apart, though. You're essentially using substitution here. So you're, you, you can think of this as 16 plus x to the half. And we just use the power rule. So this is going to be 16 plus x to the 3 halves. Divided by 3 halves means multiply by 2 thirds. And then you also divide by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside is 1, though, so we don't see that there's any extra step. If that was a 2x, we'd have to divide by 2. If it was a 3x, we'd divide by 3. If it was minus 5x, we'd divide by minus 5. And then this goes 9 to 20. So we have 32 pi over 3. Thirty-six to the three halves minus twenty-five to the three halves. You usually want to take the square root first. <coughs> so this will be thirty-two pi over three six cubed. It's two sixteen minus five cubed. 125. Yeah. And then seventy-five, eighty-five, ninety-one. Whatever that multiplies to. I forgot my calculator, of course. 32 times 91. Yeah, 
Say again? 2,912. 2,912? Yep. Thank you. And that's obviously not divisible by 3, so we leave it like that. So that's our surface area. So we integrate 2 pi r dx. All right, let's try another one. This is number 12 in the book. <coughs> so here they say rotate around the y-axis. So all we do is shift our perspective. Instead of integrating with respect to x, we integrate with respect to y. So same idea, same stuff we've been doing. So let's see if we can make this work. So our integral, we're going to have s equals. So let's take a look at these points. So if we're going to switch this and integrate with respect to y, if we plug in x equals 2, we're going to get a y value of 1. So that's 2 comma 1. Plug in 4, and that's going to be 4 comma 4. <coughs> Bless you. So we'll integrate from 1 to 4 along the y-axis. 4, 2, pi. Now r is a horizontal distance. Horizontal distances are differences in x values. So we need to write either endpoint here as an x value. Over here, we have x equals 0. Over here, we have x equals 2 square root of y. Bless you. Everybody OK with that? We multiply both sides by 4. Take the square root. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of y is root y. <coughs> so that's our function. That's representing our radius. And then we put in our ds. OK, let's come off to the side here, do our ds. We have x equals 2y to the 1 half. So x prime is going to be 1y to the minus 1 half, which is 1 over the square root of y. And then we have to square it and add 1. So 1 plus x prime squared is going to be 1 plus 1 over y. And that's what has to go inside this square root. Square root of that. This one looks like it's going to combine pretty easily. We combine our two square roots. We can pull out the constants. So we have 4 pi up front, 1 to 4. This is just going to be y plus 1 in here, I think. <coughs> and again, we have a pretty easy integrand now. Any questions on? How we got to that point? The rest is pretty routine integration. So this will be y plus 1 to the 3 halves times 2 thirds. And then we would divide by the derivative of the inside, but the derivative of the inside is just 1. So we don't really have to do anything. Huh. Ah, extend, please. <coughs> OK, so then. We evaluate, plug in a 4, 
we get 5 to the 3 halves, which is 5 root 5, minus, plug in a 1, 2 root 2. And that is our answer. Any question on any step? Yeah? Can you explain the top part to this? Going from here to here? Yeah. Like I understand you multiply two times two. Yeah. So those, those three coefficients are just popping to the front. So those guys are coming out. And then here we have a square root times a square root. So when we're multiplying square root of y times the square root of 1 plus 1 over y, this all turns into one square root where we multiply the inside of this times the inside of that. So then the y distributes and y times 1 over y is just 1. Yeah? Um, I think because they told us, yeah, so they said that we're going to rotate about the y-axis. So with arc, with uh, surface area, if you're rotating around the y-axis, you would have to go with respect to y. If you're go, going around the x-axis, you would have to go with respect to x. Yeah, so that's B. <coughs> Any other questions? So here is your general formula. This is the thing you want to have in your mind for surface area. Circumference times ds. All right, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break, and then we'll do some more integration. What else can we do? It's calc 2. <coughs> <coughs> All right, let's keep on trucking. Next one. Oh, you guys can do this one. This one doesn't look too bad. So we have a curve, square root, so a little, a little sort of arc thingy. Rotate about the x-axis on 0, 5. So go ahead and find the surface area of that. Find the surface area. Oh, wow, you guys are doing that. Six. No, no, yeah, we're talking about something else. Yeah, this is 6.6. .6. So 6.2. 6.2? the x-axis on this one.
Anybody get it yet? We'll go ahead and start this one. So we have an arc that's going to rotate about the x-axis. The radius is just the function. <coughs> so our formula is s equals the integral of 2 pi r ds. And we don't know what the limits are with respect to s, so we'll just do something like that. So then we do 2 pi, the radius is the function, and then the hard part, ds. That's the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. Of the 4 over 4 x plus 6. Let's, let me just, I'll work it out just to make sure I have the same thing you have. So I got 2 over the square root of 4x plus x. And then you have to square that. And then we'll have to square it, yes. Everyone okay with that derivative? So we use the power rule. Bring the half down, subtract 1, derivative of the inside. Cancel the 2, and then we square it exactly. So we get 4 over 4x plus 6 dx. <coughs> so that's the bulk of the work is getting that setup done there. Is there any question on any step there that you want to ask about? All right, so now it's just a matter of integrating carefully. So notice this right here, the inside of that square root, when we combine the square roots, that quantity gets distributed to, it's going to get distributed to the 1, and it's going to get distributed to this fraction. When it gets distributed to that fraction, it's just going to wipe out that denominator. So we end up with the square root of 4x plus 6 plus 4. Um, sir? Yeah? So it's not going to be 4x times 1 times, and 4x times 4 for x plus 6. Uh, 6 times 1, and then 6 times 4x. Oh, it's, you, you mean oh, foiling? Foiling. Yeah, yeah, foiling? You could foil it if you wanted to. You'd get the same answer, but really? it's a lot more work. But you could do that, actually. Get the same answer? Yeah, yeah, you would get the same answer. You would get the same answer. OK. This, let's just write one more step before we integrate. It's just 4x plus 10 underneath the square root. All right. Very similar to the last couple, but now here we definitely are going to have reverse chain rule when we integrate. So we have 2 pi. <coughs> the base is 4x plus 10. 4x plus 10 is the base raised to the half. We add 1, we get 3 halves. Multiply by 2 thirds. And then the reverse chain rule, the derivative of the inside is 4. Since we're integrating, we divide by 4, or multiply by a fourth. 0 to 5. 
Let's see, four will cancel with the two times two, so we're left with pi over three out in front. Plug in five, and five times four is 20, so we get 30 to the three halves, which we've seen this quite a bit already, which is 30 root 30. Plug in zero, and we get 10 root 10. And if we factor out 10 root 10, we would end up with 10 root 10 pi divided by 3 times 3 root 3 minus 1. Question on any step. Make sense? <laughs> yeah? Oh. Yeah, if you didn't, yeah, so be, these things take a little bit of practice. It's not hard, but it's easy to goof up this multiplication of the two square roots. And so what you're noticing is this whole quantity here gets multiplied in. So the simplest way is to notice that that and that denominator are the same, so they'll just cancel when you distribute over to that fraction. So foiling would work, but that's a lot more work. And it'd be easier to make a mistake. All right, let's take a look at this one. So this says find the area of the surface formed by revolving that curve around the x-axis. The curve is right there, square root 5x minus x squared. <coughs> um, you guys do the first two steps. Do the first two steps, and then we'll go from there. At least get it set up. I think there's going to be some little bit of hectic multiplication here, too. But get it set up. Get your derivative. I want to make sure you can get your derivative. and write down your ds properly. Raise your hand if you get once you get that whole integral set up, including the ds. So I have a sense of I've got a few of you there. Give you another minute, and we'll <coughs> go through it. I'll start with the derivative of y. <coughs> Excuse 
So the derivative of y looks a little complicated. Let's write it like this. So there's our derivative. And then we're going to have to square it and add 1. So let's do that in one step. So 1 plus y prime squared. So we square this. You could square this out right away if you want. I'll wait one more step. So we have that expression. Squaring the denominator, we square the 2, get a 4. The square of the square root just vanishes. Then we have to get a common denominator. So I'm going to write this as 25 minus 20x plus 4x squared. And I know that the common denominator is going to be 4 times 5x minus x squared. <coughs> and then up here, we're going to end up with plus 20x minus 4x squared. 20x and the 4x squared cancel. Let's pause there and make sure everybody's Where on. That second 20x plus minus so minus we're minus adding 1 to this. Oh, I see what you're, oh, okay. So I'm going to take that and multiply it right here. By, I'm going to take 1 and re rewrite it as this over itself. It. So this second part right there is coming from that denominator being distributed. So this matches that. Does that make sense to everybody? So we're taking that 1 right here and multiplying by 4 times 5x minus x squared over itself. All right, so that will be the reduced part then for 1 plus y prime squared. So our integral then, <coughs> our surface area, 2 pi rds, going to be 2 pi integral. We said we're going 1 to 4, so 1 to 4, and then that function is going to be the radius. Um, so there's the radius. And then we have to multiply it by the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. So the square root of this. This right here? Yeah. So after we have y prime, then we square it and add 1. Yeah, I was just wondering where the 2 came from. I have 5 minus x. Right here? Yeah. So the der that comes from the derivative of the inside. When we use the chain rule, the half comes down in front, we subtract 1. The derivative of this expression is 5 minus 2x. Any other questions? All right. So then we have two roots that get smushed into one. Combine those two. These will cancel. The 5x minus x squared and the 5x minus x squared, those cancel. So we end up with the integral from 1 to 4 
I'll just, before I simplify anything, I'll just write it out one more step just to make sure we're not <coughs> losing anything. So that is a perfect square. So that can be simplified. The twos cancel. Square root of four is two in the bottom. Those cancel, so we get five pi integral 1 to 4 dx. What is the integral of dx from 1 to 4? 3. 3. It's the length of the interval. 4 minus 1. So that will be 15 pi. Not too bad. All right, any other questions, Ben? Um, so in the, in the square root area, <coughs> four, um, yeah, so in the second one, shouldn't it be one plus? I don't know what happens. We did the one plus up here, but we added these together. Okay. So we um, added all that together. <coughs> so the one is already okay. built in here. That's what this is. Okay. So that's all mushed together already. Okay. So that 5 pi comes from the square root here. I can write it one more step right here. So this is 2 pi. The square root of 25 is 5. The square root of 4 is 2. Oh, okay. That makes sense? Yeah. <clears throat> Other ones? So here we've got 1.5 millimeter layer of paint is being applied to one side of this surface. Find the approximate volume of paint needed. Assume that X and Y are measured in meters. The volume of paint, of course, is area times the thickness. And they said to use meters, so 1.5 millimeters, move the decimal point three to the left for meters. All right, so the math part of this is that we've got that arc. We're going around the x-axis. We need to figure out what the surface area of that resulting surface so, is. So the upper portion just means how for the surface area is. Uh, no, we're, we're, so the upper portion of the circle is the part that I've drawn here. So the upper portion, so the spherical zone generated when the upper portion of the circle, so that's this, oh, is rotated okay. all the way around. So we're, only we're taking a circle and we're chopping off yeah, parts okay. of it. Yeah. <coughs> all right, so there's our curve. Let's go through our process. Derivative, chain rule, so we get 1 half 100 minus x squared to the minus 1 half multiplied by negative 2x because that's the derivative of the base. Y prime will simplify to negative x divided by the square root of 100 minus x squared. Now we can go ahead and do the y squared, excuse me, y prime squared plus 1. 1 plus y prime squared. So that's going to be square that, square that, add 1. And so here with the plus 1, we have two choices. We could just wait like we did in the first couple, or we could get a common denominator and make it simpler there before we put it inside the square root. It doesn't really matter. Yeah? Wouldn't that be an x squared on top? Yes, it would. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So it 
totally up to you whether you get a common denominator here or just wait and distribute because it's gonna it all comes out in the wash. This time let's just leave it as the plus one instead of getting a common denominator. The other one it was so complicated it felt better to do it here. Either way is probably about the same. All right, so then our area, our surface area, <coughs> will be 2 pi integral. We are going from minus 8 to 8. Is there any uh, shortcut that we could use here? So we could use a 0 in one of the limits of integration. Could we make zero it 4 pi? Right. From 0 to 8? Yeah, exactly. So the rotation of just this right half around will create exactly half of the surface. So we could go 0 to 8 and double it. So let's do that. That will save us a little bit of work. So we're going to double it, go 0 to 8. So 2 pi, the radius is the function, so that's square root of 100 minus x squared. That's the radius, times ds. And ds is the square root of all that stuff. So here, we didn't replace that 1 with a common denominator. But we notice that when we combine these two square roots, the denominator is going to cancel if we distribute the whole thing to the first term. And then it will be multiplied by the 1. So it doesn't matter which way you do it. So we have 4 pi, 0 to 8. <coughs> so we'll end up with square root of x squared plus 100 minus x squared. Yeah, so that'll simplify really nicely. So is everybody okay with that? This gets distributed to both. It gets distributed to this, and it gets distributed to that. And when it gets distributed to the first thing, it just leaves an x squared. Distributed to 1, the whole thing is still there. But then it simplifies really nicely. Those x squareds disappear. <coughs> so we get 10 times 4, so we get 40 pi. Integral 0 to 8 dx. And the integral of dx from 0 to 8? Eight, 8 minus 0, which is 8. So we'll do 8 times 4. That will be, now this is the area. We're not done. This is the area. It's our first step. They wanted us to figure out the volume of paint necessary. I'm 0 0.001. Yeah, so we'll multiply by the thickness of a layer of paint, and that will give us the volume of paint that we need. So we'll take that, we're going to multiply it by 0 0.0015, and that will give us our cubic meters of paint. I went to my office and I forgot, my, forgot to bring my calculator back. So let's do this as an approximation. So put the pi in there. So we just have a numerical value without a pi in it. Let's do that out to a couple decimal places. That would be 0 0.48 pi. 0 0.84 pi? 48. 0.48 pi. And then if we put the pi in there, so 0.48 times 3.14. So that would be the volume we're looking for. Take a lot of paint. All right. Try another one. <coughs> 
So go ahead and set this one up. So notice we're going about the y-axis. Y-axis. Raise a hand once you get the integral set up. Got a few. Maybe another 30 seconds or something. Question? Sure. Since those are x values, we have to convert those to the y corresponding y values. So if we look at our graph here, when x is 0, we plug in 0 and we see that this point is uh, 0, 1. When we plug in 1, we see that this point is 0, uh, excuse me, is 1, comma e. All right, so we are going around the y-axis. <coughs> so that means we want to solve that equation for x. So our function is x equals the natural log of y. We can go ahead and do the ds part, take the derivative, square it, add 1. So our derivative is 1 over y. The derivative squared plus 1. <coughs> we'll have that. If you want, you can get a common denominator, denominator there or just wait. It doesn't matter. Let's do it with common denominator this time. So we rewrite 1 as y squared over y squared and add them together. So our surface area will be 2 pi r ds. So r, let's draw sketch r, that's right there. <coughs> so r is the function. So that's natural log of y. Then we have to multiply by ds. So ds is going to be the square root of 1 plus y squared over y squared dy. And that's going to be from 1 to e. So there's our setup. Now, of course, we always have to be very careful. This says use technology. Hopefully that's obvious. You don't know how to integrate that yet. You've got a natural log and a square root. Question? Uh, do, do we not have to square root ln y? No, not for the radius. So the formula is the integral of 2 pi r ds. So the radius doesn't get squared for surface area. If we were doing volume, 
and we were doing cross sections that were disks, then we'd have to do a pi r squared. But in this case, we don't. <coughs> so now we've got to integrate that uh, with technology. That's one that we don't know how to integrate by hand. So we use some sort of graphing gizmo. How am I going to get the, I don't know if I do that. All right. So let's see. I need natural log of x. I'm turn everything to x's. I'll put a 2 pi out in front. Limits of integration, make that an E. One. And then down here. Sheesh. All that needs to go away. So we'll do one plus x squared. over x squared, right? Why is it giving me an error? Let's, see, let's make sure that that's a power. Say again? I have a feeling it might be these parentheses around this little x right here. Might want that. Yeah. There we go. So 7.05. Mm -hmm. I'll bring that over just to remind everybody that we need that little. Uh, you and this one. So there's our approximation. Any questions on that? surface area. Should we do one more of those or should we do something else? What would you like to do? One more surface area or one more? All right, let me go pull one up. That. Sarah, then I, maybe we'll do, I think we should do a few more uh, volumes. Let's see, what the heck, not there, I don't want to be there. Don't be there. Chapter six. This one's a pretty easy one. Maybe we'll do two. Maybe we'll do one that's easy and then one that's harder. So with surface area, they give us the hint that you uh, go around the y-axis that you have to integrate with respect to y. But with surface area, you don't really have a choice. 
you're going to rotate about the y-axis, you have to use the dy. If you're going to go about the x-axis, you have to use the dx. So y looks. We didn't do this one already, did we? No. OK. All of a sudden, it looked really familiar. <laughs> Maybe you've done it before. Yeah, I might have done it before. <laughs> I feel like we had a derivative that was equal to 5 on the inside once before today, but maybe. All right, so tell me once you get the integral set up. Was that a hand up already? No, OK. Lightning fast. Oh yeah, we didn't, yeah, this is uh, around the y-axis anyway, so you can, a little bit different than, we did one similar that was around the x-axis. All right, so we're going to go around the y-axis. So we have to have limits of integration that are y values. So let's go ahead and at least figure those out <coughs> first. So when we plug in the 7 fifths, this point down here is going to be 7 fifths comma 3. No, that can't be right. What's going on here? Oh, I, did, I think I saw that as a 17 fifths and not a 7 fifths. So let me go back to the graph real quick. Get out of here. You are not the right graph. You are not the graph we are looking for. 7 fifths. That's better. So starting over, plug in 7 fifths, we get what, 7 fifths comma 3 for this point. Plug in 18 fifths and we get 18 fifths comma uh, 14. All right. The curve, we are going to have to find it as an x value, we'll have to write it as a function of y, write it x equals a function of y. <coughs> so 
So y equals 5x minus 4. That will be 5x equals y plus 4, which is x equals 1 fifth y plus 4 fifths. <coughs> we'll do the ds piece. Take the derivative. Oh, not too bad. Square it and add 1. One twenty fifths, one twenty fifth plus one, which is twenty six twenty fifths. So then our surface area is going to be the integral from three to fourteen, two pi r ds. R is the function right there. 1 fifth y plus 4 fifths. Multiply by ds, which is the square root of x prime squared plus 1. We already did the plus 1. dy. So we'll pull out our constants. Square root of 26 times 2, so we have 2 square root of 26 times pi divided by 5. Um, and then, actually, let's pull out the 1 fifth also, so that will be a 1 25th. And then we're going to be left with the integral from 3 to 14 of y plus 4. Is everybody okay with factoring all that stuff out? Factor it out. All the constants. And then this should simplify pretty nicely. All right, so plugging in our limits of integration. We have 14 times 7, 14 times 14, but divide by 2, so we get, what, 98 uh, plus 56 minus 9 halves minus 12, I think. And then whatever that simplifies to. Say again? That's what this is? Thank you. And I think you said 375 over 2? 275. 275 over 2. Thank you. Finger eraser, This is a multi-touch board. Most people. use it pretty well, man. I've been teaching the past, and I have no idea what they're doing with this thing. There's almost no one that knows how to use it as multi-touch. You can program your finger to be one thing and your... Which is, because I see everyone else like pick up the erasers and take one, and like you with the clipping and the, yeah, you the can highlighting and the boxing and everything, it's like really easy to follow. We'll have to try. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So I, I really like it, so. It's, Thank you. It's way easier than, like I took this class this summer and I had no idea what to do with right on the floor. And you, who did you take it with? I was Dr. O, so I, I, yeah. I, no, I Not here on this campus. No, it was on this campus. Was on this campus? Who? It was a Dr. O. It was a guy from Africa. Uh, oh! I can't pronounce his name. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I know who you mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's Osita. Yeah, he was just kind of flying through it. Yeah. This, this is a lot better. Yeah, we were trying to teach him the smart board when he first started here. He's still relatively new. <coughs> All right, so 25 goes into there 11 times. And then we get... Final answer. Yeah. Cool. Got it. 
All right, so two choices. Should we do a cylinder? We I want to do a volume one, so should we do washers? I don't want to do discs. Washers or cylinders? Cylinders. cylinders? cylinders in the past, I've noticed those are the ones that seem to be the the, air, the volume problems that most are most difficult for people to grasp. So let's do that. Yeah, I think that's it's, and the confusion tends to be because you have two different directions going on at the same time. All right, so let's take a look at the, oh, let me just talk a little bit about 6-7. We'll do that on Tuesday. Highly recommend, I always highly recommend that you read ahead of time because that makes, when we only meet twice a week, reading ahead of time really you know, two and a half hours, two hours and 15 minutes of class is a long time. If you get confused in the first 20 minutes, <laughs> that's a long way to go before you can escape. So we, and on Tuesday, we're going to do all the physical applications, which tend to be complicated. We'll be doing work and force, which that, uh, most of you have had some familiarity with that. The ones that are going to be weird are pressure and underwater force. So definitely read 6-7. And I, there's a, a couple of videos that I put up. I had that one video in the announcement, but what I'm going to do is just move all the videos. There's a lot of cool videos on YouTube these days, and so what I'm going to do is just try to put at least one up per week of something that's kind of relevant to what we're doing. And so next week is week four. And so these two videos, uh, are really good on understanding hydrostatic pressure, which is one of the things that we'll be doing. And the second one is totally fascinating. They call it the hydrostatic paradox. And you've got to watch that just to get a sense of what's going on with it, because it's a very strange, it seems very strange at first. But she does a really good job of explaining what the paradox is and why the math works out the way it does. So watching those two videos would be really smart um, to do and to read seven, uh, chapter six, section seven. And those videos are on, on? They're on YouTube, so if you just click on it, they'll go. No, but I mean like, uh, are they on, is this the D2L here? Yeah, this is in D2L, okay. D2L under discussions. Yeah. yeah, if you go D2L under discussions, I used to have them in the announcements, but I figured some people might want to comment on them or ask a question, so I put them over here so you could ask a question or something if you wanted. But both of those are really good videos to get a sense of what pressure, how pressure is defined. So take a look at those and let's do a cylindrical shell. Uh, let's see. Shell method, ideally, let's do a harder one like that. Where it's not rotated about the x or y axis. So, yeah, we were the first college in the state of Colorado that got smart boards. 2001. 2001. You know to use them well. When we first got them, teachers were so angry that they would take these markers and they would write on them and say, take this away or no. Or they were really angry when we first got them. <laughs> Now, most teachers, if we put them in a room without a smart board, they flip out. Like, Where's the smart board? <coughs> All right, so this says that we've got this region, y equals x, bounded by y equals x squared, x equals 1, and y equals 0. So let's go ahead and just sketch that real quick. So it's always good to have a picture so you can kind of see what the heck's going on. So we've got this idea right there. That, that region is going to be rotated, and it's going to be rotated about the line x equals 16. So x equals 16 is way out here, and we have to just, we just need a general idea of how things are related. So if we're going to use a cylindrical shell, 
vertical or horizontal element? Vertical element, because we're rotating about this axis here at x equals 16. So we want to think to ourselves, the element rotated about that axis has to create a cylinder. What would a horizontal element create rotated about that? Create a washer, a disc with a hole in it. So we want to use a vertical element so that we're creating a cylinder. And then we need to identify the radius of the cylinder <coughs> and the height of the cylinder. The radius of the cylinder is right there. And then the height of the cylinder is this function. So the height is right there. Can everyone visualize what that solid object is going to look like? There's a good graphing utility, which I'll show you how to use, called GeoGebra. And it does really nice 3D graphs. So you can do the same kind of thing with Desmos. Desmos has a 3D application that you can graph with graph 3D within it. But Desmos is really just meant for 2D. So this program called GeoGebra does 3D graphs really nicely. So it's at geogebra.org. It's free software also. All right, so then here we want to find the area of a cylinder. The area of the cylinder is going to be <coughs> 2 pi rh. So for us, we look at that element. The thickness of that element is dx. So we know that we want to write things as functions of x. And so we go over here and we say, all right, well, the radius is what? That's the vertical element at x. So what is the radius? 16 minus x. Perfect. And then what's the height? X squared. Just x squared. That's the function. So there is the area <coughs> of the cylinder at x. So if we rotate around at, say, x equals 1 half, we would plug in a 1 half there, and that would give us the area of that cylinder. So our volume is then the integral 2 pi times all that. And we're going to go from 0 to 1. And just keep in mind that this 0 to 1 is this right here, not this 0 to 1, that 0 to 1. <coughs> Distribute the x squared. And we've got that. And pretty easy to integrate that. Power rule, plug and chug. So we get 2 pi 16 x cubed divided by 3 minus x to the fourth divided by 4. Actually, he took all my notes for that class. Did he? Right? Did he? Yeah. But we didn't go like it would generally be like uh, like I felt like he was we were when he was teaching the class like he was learning it just as much as we were. Like, <laughs> That's a bad sign. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we teachers we were always learning, but if he's learning the same amount as you're learning, yeah, no, it just like it just seemed like it was like we were like kind of like learning it all together. Like he like, first time teaching the class, more, so, <coughs> uh, I just it was and it was like the, the accelerated nature. That's summer. definitely not someone you want to take an avalanche class with. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> learning at the same time. Okay, so we got a common denominator of 12. So we're going to have 64 twelfths minus uh, 3 twelfths. So that will be 2 pi times 61 over 12. Cancel out a 6, excuse me, cancel out a 2. And we will be left with 61 pi divided by 6. And that will be our volume of our solid using shells. So one good thing to practice to do this with washers and make sure you come up with the same answers, you know, a good thing to do. Any questions on any of those steps? All right. We'll stop there. Have a good weekend.
Well, hopefully I will be through my call by the next time I see you. Sick of being sick. <laughs>